My name is Terry Beers. I'm a professor of English at Santa Clara University. And as part of my job there, I'm editor of a series of books called California Legacy that we publish with Heyday Books uh, and Santa Clara University. I'm also a producer of something called Your California Legacy, which is a uh, series of dramatic readings of California literature and history. And we're currently working on a sort of uh, expanded version of that called Nature Dreaming. Uh, we have some grant proposals out um, where we're hoping to do uh, some hour-long public radio uh, pieces on California landscape writing. So I guess the kind of writing I do, um, uh, grant proposals for sure, I do academic writing, I um, uh, publish academic articles, and uh, pieces for uh, more public audiences through California Legacy. So I do kind of a lot of different things uh, when it comes to writing and, and doing research. You know, writing grant proposals um, has turned into, you know, a much more research intensive uh, activity than I thought it would be at first because, especially for, say, an NEH proposal, National Endowment for the Humanities, a lot of humanities scholarship has to be embedded into the uh, grant proposal. So as a result of that, trying to translate uh, academic specialist research into a grant proposal for a project that is intended for a public audience is really quite challenging. Uh, so, so there's that and, and, and do a lot of that same work for California Legacy in the books as well. That's in some ways a lot less challenging than it used to be um, in terms of doing the, the research for academic writing. And, you know, 20 years ago when I was writing a dissertation and, and sort of, you know, trying to sort of get out of that place where one was a novice academic and, and, and into a more professional realm, you know, there were card catalogs and uh, reader's guides and bibliographies that you had to consult. And now so much of that is online. And I sometimes feel like I'm a little bit behind my students when it comes to doing research. Um, so a lot of that is, is, is easier than it used to be, but it's still challenging finding all of the sources that one needs to find, not just through um, consulting bibliographies, but now because of the um, specialist areas, at least in a discipline like English, there's so many different specialist areas, they all have their own language, and so that, I think, especially for novice researchers, is daunting, because until you have a sense of how to recognize the assumptions that literary critics bring, because they don't always um, talk about them in a way that is explicit when you're just learning, uh, that's daunting. And, um, uh, but it's, it, it's easier because it's just easier to get to the material, if not um, any easier to understand it sometimes, yes. Journals on the internet, um, certainly, and then internet sites themselves, um, some of the um, scholarly sites that are set up that are not necessarily journalist um, sites. Um, the Robinson Jeffers Association, for example, maintains a website that's very useful for Jeffers scholars, but it's not itself a journal. And then um, online databases that are available through university libraries and, and good public libraries um, are just, you know, wonderful wealth for, of information. And then something I use a lot for California Legacy um, radio segments are a lot of the online primary source um, sources that are available now. So the University of Michigan has online um, a good deal of journals, um, Overland Monthly from California, um, or to go to the Library of Congress. And the Library of Congress maintains a site, uh, first person narratives of what I saw in California. And literally hundreds of um, scanned texts of primary source material from people who traveled through California, um, diaries, letters, um, travel journals, journalism, um, things like that. So the, the internet has made available a lot of things that were just hard to find and then you had to go and travel and, and, and get there and make copies and now it's, it's, it's cut and paste for a lot of this stuff. So it's, it, it, it's a tremendous time to be doing research. Things that are published um, or maintained by places like the um, University of Michigan or the Library of Congress, they have their own um, kind of um, provenance that we can trust, I think, you know, for the most part. Uh, so the primary source material is less of a problem than uh, websites that are not maintained by scholarly or um, uh, university sources. Uh, to go back to the Jeffers Association, so that's an association of scholars interested in the work of Robinson Jeffers. The material that's up there is, is, is trustworthy, and, and, and you will know that. 
But maybe the best way to be able to even judge something like that is to realize that the contributions of the website and the people who maintain that website are people you can um, also find in bibliographies of Jeffers research. So sometimes it's nice to sort of um, cross-check what you find on a website, even though it appears to be quite um, reputable against more um, reliable print sources or traditional print sources, things like that. So you're always sort of like going back and forth. My sense working with students is that they think that everything is online now, and a lot more is online than there used to be, and maybe in 10 years everything will be online, but you know, you still have to sort of go to the library sometimes too. Well, I can start there, um, and it's amazing what you can find in terms of, of Google searches. Um, but what I'll probably do before I do that is go to um, an online database. Uh, Santa Clara University, for example, maintains um, databases through Gale Research Corporation, and so that gives you access to the Modern Language Association um, bibliography and through the various things like um, contemporary writers and um, uh, uh, what about a dictionary of literary biography, places like that. And those sources themselves are, are vetted and they have their own bibliographies. Um, and so that way it's a, it's a way to get into things that are reputable and scholarly and then that gives you maybe some preparation before you go out onto the internet in general and then start looking at websites and things. You have a sense of what you're looking for and what you suspect might be trustworthy. Because there's a lot of stuff out there that's not. It really starts with being inspired in one way or another by a particular um, primary source. I've written about Jeffers and I've written about call it California writers, but I've also written on literary criticism. Um, and so sometimes there's a problem that interests me and I'll want to tackle the problem. And then you know you sort of step back from there. And at least within English studies, um, it's back to the bibliographies and the journal articles and things. Um, and, and to do that reading, and I think the best advice I would have for, for folks doing this is not to try to settle on an idea or a thesis or a hypothesis too soon. Let it percolate and don't try to write before you really know what you want to do. Um, and then the other issue is then as you begin to know more about your poet or your writer or your literary problem or your political science problem, whatever it might be, is not to let your sources drive the writing. And I think that's really one of the big problems is that there's a tendency to try to say this person says this and this person says this and this person says this and here's what I think. Well the here's what I think maybe starts first and then you drive that and then the sources are ways to contextualize your own opinion and your own argument. So the metaphor I like to think of in terms of doing research um, and writing that is supported by research is to think of the uh, research that you're going to do is sort of like finding out what's been said at a party before you arrive. So that when you get there, you listen for a little bit, you kind of find out what people are saying, and you know where your opinion fits in this, and then before you begin to um, uh, be part of that conversation, kind of know where you fit. And then you know who agrees with you and maybe who doesn't, or whose ideas are subject to modification, that kind of thing. So that the idea of research is partly to inform yourself, but also to partly understand where your opinion fits in this larger conversation. I tend to have like a pad of paper with me and I just kind of do scratch outline notes um, both from a source and what I think I'm working on. Um, I've been experimenting lately with note taking on a computer, uh, which I never thought I would do because I'm kind of comfortable and I like to write things out, but I also have really terrible handwriting so sometimes I go back and I can't really read what I've written. Um, but there's a program that I found um, that's available free download, it's called Evernote, evernote.com. And it's a wonderful note-taking um, apparatus. You can uh, categorize notes by topics. You can cross-reference notes. And what it does is it keeps a sort of scroll bar of all your notes in order, but then you can jump around and it's very searchable. It's free. It also lets you um, uh, keep a uh, database of your notes online, which means you can download your um, note um, uh, database to any computer that has um, the software on it. And so what that means is you can take your laptop into the library, you can take notes. If you're taking notes off of something that is online, you can um, literally clip that into your note um, software without having to write anything out. And so one of the things that it tends to um, do, at least for me, is it encourages more note taking because it's not as physically um, demanding as 
writing it out and you know getting uh, tired with your fingers and your wrists and everything else. So I've I've not abandoned um, writing notes entirely, but I am finding I'm doing a lot more of it on the computer than I used to. Sometimes it's thoughts and supporting quotes. Um, sometimes I'm just literally um, taking something out, um, you know, in, in that old model of um, using note cards for doing a research paper, for example. You might um, literally be writing down quotations from sources, primary, secondary sources, that kind of thing. And, I, you know, I would still do that on the computer. But a lot of times um, what I'm doing is sort of keeping track of my own ideas as they develop against what I'm reading. Um, and so you can do this relatively easily on the computer because you could, you know, cut and paste a, a piece from an article or a journal article and then right below that, you know, um, put down your own reactions to it. And that's useful because the reaction may not be something that you use later, but it might be. But it's good to have it in physical, um, um, or, or virtually physical, I suppose, um, proximity to what the original um, source was that inspired the comment or whatever. So you can kind of recover that sense of uh, exchange between source and thinking about source and then going back to the source. And so that's a very useful um, uh, dynamic to have, and it's very easy to do on a computer. I have to see it in print, um, and it. It, 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 I'm sure it kills trees, um, but there's something about having something in print that makes it easier to me. So even though I'll do a lot of the note taking um, on a computer, I will print the notes out and arrange them and rethink them. And then sometimes, you know, um, on notes that have been um, taken on Evernote or, or, or Word or whatever I, I might have up, I'll print those out and then I'll, you know, by hand, I'll gloss those things um, and go back to them. So there's still, you know, that sense of, of still having a kind of physical text in front of me not as, as opposed to something on screen or virtual that uh, I, I, I still need. And I'll give the same advice to students, it's print it out because you won't see it in the same way. And there's also something, I mean, with a computer screen, there are programs, I, I don't know how to use them, that will let you jump around um, uh, in that same kind of random access way that, you know, a book allows you to do. Um, but there's still something about being able to rearrange pages or put one over here and here and look at them at the same time that's very hard to do on a computer screen and, and, and having that, um, that example and that physical um, ability to look at two things like that I think is just important. I think that's the hardest thing to do in research writing. It's, it's harder than, than creating the draft. It's even harder than creating the thesis statement. It's, it, it's getting to the point where you feel confident enough in the subject and the idea that you want to start um, uh, juxtaposing some of your um, initial reactions against each other and trying to develop where it is you want to go with that. And I think that, I think that most writers, from what I have read, um, have a pretty messy process when it comes to this. And it's partly reading, it's partly thinking, it's partly, in, in my case at least, writing scratch outlines and then going back and scratching those out. Um, and it's partly getting out and walking the dog or going swimming or something like that. So you get away from it and come back to it a little bit later. And I think that that exchange of, you know, some time away from it and then um, coming back and re-engaging the ideas is key. And sometimes what I see with, with students is there's a sense to sometimes put things off and then try to do it all at one time. And there's something a, a professor said to me in graduate school, Ross Winterout, and he said that um, the act of inscription is incidental to writing. And what he meant by that was that the drafting is really not the hard part. The hard part is the thinking and getting ready to write. And I think that's the part that gets squeezed because we have so many other things to do that we're, we're, we're um, not thinking things through or not even taking that you know, two or three minutes a day it might take to pick up a book or a note or something. So you're trying to do all of the thinking and all of the arrangement and all of the note taking and all of that and then the drafting in such a small amount of time that you're just not ready to do the writing. It's too often a dumping, and you know, um, this is interesting because I've been having conferences with students all this week about research writing that they're doing in a um, course that we teach. It's called Introduction to Literary Scholarship. So I have students who are right now um, writing papers to incorporate research about novels that they've written, and it's so. It, 
it, it, it's so often the case that they finish their draft and then at that point they've actually got their thesis statement. And I know you know this, right? Um, and, and then they need to sort of go back, but sometimes they haven't left themselves time to have you know, written that through and discovered what it is they really know. Um, and so that, that key of, of, of time and stretching that process out I think is just crucial. Something that I learned to do, I think, some time ago, and um, it was more or less abandoning, learning to abandon um, ideas, and what that meant was abandoning research and notes. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I talk to students, it's like, you know, Medea had to kill her children, and sometimes you have to do the same thing with your ideas and everything. You have to have that sense where you feel that that's just a a, a different paper or a different project it doesn't belong here and I mean everyone has to do that but I think that took me a long time to learn there's always a sense of, of trying to make everything conform to something and becoming comfortable with doing something else or changing plans um, it took me a long long time well what I like about research is Finding stuff that I didn't know, um, and you know, anytime you're going to do research, you know, you've got some preconceived idea or notion or you know, topic or something like that. And so, when you find things that you don't know, that's that's stimulating. Um, one of the things that I like about doing is, is is finding things that contradict my opinions, but don't change them. Um, I, I, I think a lot of novice writers either find find sources that um, don't support their point of view and so they just don't deal with them. They, they, they drop it out. Um, or find those sources and then just kind of look at them as a contradiction and they may cite them but not fully engage them. And I think that that's a lost opportunity often because if someone has an opinion that is well stated and, and challenges you and you can find a way to overcome that opinion, then I think that reinforces your own authority and it reinforces your own credibility and it will reinforce that credibility with your readers. All the time you hear this, well, I, I came across this source that was really interesting but it didn't support my point of view. And you just go, oh, gee. <laughs> it's tiring, you know, I, I, I think. And, and there's a sense where I think one has to find um, a balance between, you know, research and rest and physical activity and mental um, relaxation and, and recreation. And sometimes there is a sense where you get tracked into um, doing the research and you keep working on it and you keep working on it and you don't realize how tired you get and that how your search capacities, or your uh, capacity to evaluate and judge the material somehow begins to erode. And it's, it, it, it's that that can lead into you know, real problems later because you wind up spending a lot of your time in an unproductive way. And I guess that's not really um, something I don't like about research so much as it's something that I don't like about myself. You know, it's like you, know, you, you need to stay in control of the research process and your purposes. Serendipity. Um, sometimes you just find something by accident. Um, and this has become kind of an issue on our campus because we have um, a new library and a lot of the books that used to be um, available in open stacks are now in storage and you have to um, uh, find them in, in, in the card, online card catalogs and make a request to have them. And I don't think that there were a lot of choices given, you know, um, budgets and everything else. Um, at the same time, there was always that possibility of going into the stacks and kind of just looking around in the books, looking to see what books were around the one that you're really looking for, and then finding something that sometimes could be your favorite source. And maybe, you know, that can still be done. It, that's certainly done online, but uh, just being open to that sense where you may be going after something particular, but looking to see what's around it and, and evaluating that and just taking that extra time because sometimes that really leads to something that's unexpected and, and, and very valuable. Mm -hmm.